Hi, I'm Dr. Shonali Chandra and I welcome you all to our YouTube channel Medicine Decoded. Now in the recent times we've seen that they've been asking you questions on ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome that's OHSS and it is of particular relevance in current times because over the past decades or so we've seen yes an increasing number of in vitro fertilizations being done for assisted reproductive techniques in couples dealing with infertility right so as undergraduate students they expect you to know a very important complication of IVF procedure that is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome so I'm going to answer certain very basic questions regarding OHSS and to begin with what exactly is it now it is a medical complication of in vitro fertilization procedure it's a completely iatrogenic complication it happens because of the gonadotropins which we use in ovarian stimulation in assisted reproductive technique cycles like in vitro fertilization and the symptoms of OHS they develop because of uh, you know ovarian enlargement that occurs when this syndrome sets in because of the capillary permeability that is increased because of the extravascular fluid accumulation and also because of the intravascular volume depletion. So let's get down deep into the pathogenesis of OHSS. Now before we discuss the pathogenesis of OHSS in particular, it's important for us to understand what exactly is being done in the in vitro fertilization cycle per se. So I'm going to give you a broad overview, not the detailed description that's going to go beyond the scope of this video. But yes, we go for controlled ovarian hyperstimulation using gonadotropins. We also use GnRH analogs. There are various protocols involved. Nonetheless, yes, gonadotropins are used to stimulate the ovaries the goal is to achieve multiple follicles growing right so that is why controlled ovarian hyperstimulation once we get multiple follicles the next step is to give an ovulation trigger which is often an hcg injection right once the ovulation trigger has been given 36 hours later the oocytes are retrieved okay and then the oocytes are fertilized with the uh, husband semen sample in the lab we get an embryo right and then that embryo is transferred in utero that is called as embryo transfer all right and after that you know this embryo is going to implant itself and a pregnancy is going to be achieved right now in this entire process sometimes the hyperstimulation can be excessive we are trying to achieve controlled hyperstimulation and it can go out of control and then it leads to a syndrome which is called as ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome these stimulated ovaries the granulosa cells the stroma they secrete vasoactive substances like uh, vascular endothelial growth factor like those inflammatory cytokines and interleukins and tumor necrosis factors so multiple of these vasoactive active uh, peptides are secreted from the ovaries into the circulation and they trigger the changes responsible for ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So the gonadotropins here are directly responsible for follicular growth and it is important to remember that we see OHSS in cycles that we have stimulated with gonadotropins therefore seen during IVF most often right uh, meaning that when we use let's say clomiphene citrate for ovulation induction the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is extremely less and it is hardly ever seen with letrozole induced cycles okay and HCG here can mimic uh, luteinizing hormone in its action and therefore can directly stimulate the ovarian stroma as well contributing to the development of OHHS. So yes, they ask you also questions regarding the timing 
of the development of this uh, syndrome. So, the syndrome can develop any time during the stimulation protocol here while uh, doing IVF but most often it develops let us say about 3 to, t, uh, 3 to 7 days after the trigger. Trigger is the HCG trigger. So, this is called as early uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And the second most plausible time for development of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is when a successful pregnancy is achieved because this uh, implanting embryo here is going to synthesize uh, HCG on its own, endogenous HCG synthesized by the developing embryo uh, here and the implanting pregnancy here and further contribute to development of OHHS at a later point in time uh, about the second time would be about let us say for example uh, 12 to 17 days after the trigger that is called as late OHHS that develops if a successful pregnancy sets in and you can understand that that if there are multiple uh, pregnancy here then more the HCG and therefore more risk of OHHS and probably more severe the OHHS. So, let us summarize the pathogenesis here. Okay, So, there is gonadotropin stimulation, there is HCG involved leading to ovarian hyperstimulation. Those hyperstimulated ovaries are enlarged in size as well. Uh, they secrete vasoactive substances like vascular endothelial growth factor, other inflammatory cytokines which are uh, released by ovaries, yes, but they do not you know, remain confined to the ovaries. I mean, they seep into the maternal systemic circulation and wherever they go, they you know, contribute to increased capillary permeability, which is the hallmark of the pathogenesis of uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and one important ultrasonographic image to remember uh, would be this for your exams where you can see that the ovaries are enlarged okay there are numerous follicles growing in multiple stages of development varying stages of development and most often they are more than 20 when it is considered very very significant and high risk of developing or ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome so remember this image as well now moving on let us see what happens because of this increased capillary permeability. Now because of this reason there is fluid shift right into the third space fluid shift from the intravascular compartment to the extravascular compartment leading to a peripheral edema. It can begin uh, from the lower limb, it can be a generalized edema as well and this further can be severe in the sense that there can be uh, fluid accumulation in the lungs, in the pleural spaces, in the pericardial spaces leading to hydrothorax, there can be ascites, right and when such severe degree of fluid shift happens, it is going to lead to obviously intravascular here volume contraction, it is going to lead to hypovolemia, it is going to lead to hypotension and ultimately obviously it is going to lead to decreased renal perfusion here because of the hypovolemia and hypotension and it may even lead to oliguria that is decreased urine output. So, multi-system involvement uh, can occur eventually because of these enlarged ovaries releasing vasoactive substances into the circulation. Now, when fluid shift also happens, it also leads to a hemoconcentration and this hemoconcentration is dangerous. Why? Because uh, to add to the effect of hemoconcentration is decreased peripheral perfusion, right? Because of hemoconcentration per se, because of hypotension and hypovolemia as well, there is decreased peripheral perfusion, slowing of blood flows, 
stasis and all of this contributing to the increased risk of thrombosis in these women more particularly a venous thrombosis than arterial both types can occur but more often it is venous thrombosis and this can all escalate and progress to life threatening complications like renal failure it can lead to life threatening complications like ARDS or it can lead to life threatening complications like venous thromboembolism and this is why I believe that they have been asking you questions on the identification or how to make the diagnosis of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome because it can potentially become a life-threatening complication as well. Now moving on, let us just highlight what are the important risk factors, who are the set of women undergoing in vitro fertilization who are at more risk of developing ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, younger age of women, you know, higher dosages of gonadotropins being used while doing the stimulation, women who have PCOS and they are undergoing ovarian stimulation as part of IVF, basically somebody who has uh, a lot of ovarian reserve basically. So uh, to begin with, there are many numerous follicles and therefore subsequently more risk of going into ovarian hyperstimulation. So PCOS or somebody who has uh, initially before before starting the IVF, a raised serum uh, anti-mullerian hormone levels, which would mean that she has, uh, you know, a higher ovarian reserve or more number of residual follicular pool as well, or higher estradiol at the time of HCG trigger. Now, I want to just uh, emphasize this here by showing you this diagram again. So, when we're going for the ovarian uh, stimulation during IVF, right, we're giving the gonadotropin injections and we're doing multiple scans on daily basis, on alternate day basis to see how the ovaries are responding, right. We actually count the number of follicles that are developing. We go for regular monitoring of serum estradiol levels also because these growing follicles, many of these growing, all of these growing follicles will individually you know uh, release estradiol into circulation so serum estradiol levels are also measured during the estra, during the uh, stimulation protocol so on the day of giving the trigger that is on the day of giving the hcg injection if there is already too much of serum estradiol in circulation that would mean that these uh, the ovaries are overstimulated right if uh, on the day of the trigger if already there are numerous follicles more than 20 more than 25 that would also mean that you know potentially it can develop ovarian hyperstimulation uh, syndrome at a later point in time so these are also the risk factors that we identify during the stimulation protocol so higher estradiol level at the time of scg trigger like about more than 2500 to 3500 picogram per ml the range can vary from institution to institution higher number of follicles more than 20 to 25 uh, follicles on the day of the hcg trigger will also be a risk factor now that we've talked about the pathogenesis the clinical presentation should be simple to grasp okay so because of the enlarged ovaries you know there was going to be a stretching of the ovarian capsule there's going to be a sense of abdominal pain and discomfort uh, in the pelvis right so lower abdominal pain discomfort uh, peritoneal symptomatology like nausea vomiting there can also be diarrhea there can be abdominal distension so these are the preliminary or beginning of the symptoms here itself so my Milder cases are going to present with this kind of clinical presentation and uh, there can also be a shortness of breath because of the uh, pulmonary involvement because of the pleural effusion uh, presentation can be with oliguria decreased urine 
output uh, peripheral uh, edema right there can be rapid gain in weight uh, there can also be uh, symptoms of hypovolemia you know there can be dehydration there can be hypotension there can be tachycardia so women could may present with uh, hemodynamic instability itself so that would mean that the progression is becoming uh, severe okay and if you look at the examination findings well yes you can uh, look for the presence of uh, ascites uh, clinically you can also uh, clinically judge the uh, ovarian enlargement by doing a per vaginal examination and an ultrasound can always help you you know to arrive at the diagnosis and our ultrasound will be able to pick up the enlarged ovaries and the multiple follicles as well but yes there is a set of differential diagnosis which you need to keep in mind considering the symptomatology and the examination findings and if you are the person who is sitting in the uh, emergency room and you know a patient with this clinical symptomatology presents you might think of uh, ovarian cysts you might think of ovarian torsion you might think of appendicitis or cholecystitis or you know ectopic pregnancy or pelvic inflammatory disease for that matter so this is going to be the differential diagnosis but uh, apart from the clinical symptomatology the one important thing that will arrive you at the diagnosis of OHHS is history yes a recent history of ovulation induction of being induced or inducted into the IVF cycle don't miss out on this history this is going to be your biggest clue that what you're dealing with here is not an ovarian cyst not an ovarian torsion but rather an OHHS and having said that please remember that these enlarged ovaries with ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome they themselves are at risk of undergoing ovarian torsion also so the risk of ovarian torsion with OHHS is also there now let's talk about the set of investigations that you are going to perform right so you're going to order a complete blood count right and the important point for diagnosis would be hemoconcentration so the hematocrit will be raised right liver function tests yes the enzymes ALT, AST, alkaline phosphatase will be raised. You're going to go for a renal profile, kidney function test. So again, your uh, serum creatinine levels could be elevated. Your blood urea and blood urea nitrogen could be elevated. And there is going to be a hypo proteinemia right so the serum protein and serum albumin concentration is going to be decreased and along with this you know obviously uh, if the kidneys are involved and if they are subjected to uh, uh, you know oliguria and renal hypo uh, hypoperfusion then of course there can be a decreased uh, the decreased creatinine clearance as well uh, make sure you send for the serum electrolytes also electrolyte imbalance can can happen with this kind of fluid shift right there can be uh, hyponatremia and there can be hyperkalemia as well uh, make sure you send for a coagulation profile right so uh, because of the risk of thrombosis that is involved you do need to have a baseline uh, coagulation profile in place so uh, make sure you send for the PT and the APTT and the INR values and if the patient is also having a breathlessness and you know if she's having decreased oxygen saturation as well make sure in that case you send for the arterial blood gas uh, analysis also you may be having uh, acidosis and uh, initial set of investigations would also involve an ultrasound abdomen and pelvis will help you see the size of the ovaries will also help you uh, see uh, the ascites if there is and uh, a chest x-ray should also be uh, done if the woman is having pulmonary symptoms 
now at the end of your initial evaluation if the patient is not able to tolerate orally if there is a worsening of symptoms if there is ascites if there is ascites a worsening of symptoms and inability to tolerate orally these are early signs that the patient may progress to a severe illness if there is already hemodynamic instability respiratory compromise oliguria or deranged you know lab parameters then these are any of these is an indication for hospitalization and inpatient treatment now let us talk about the management of ohhs so ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome per se is a self limiting disorder okay and it, the woman is going to improve over a course of several days provided we monitor her regularly right we monitor uh, her symptoms we monitor uh, her lab parameters because we want to prevent uh, complications from developing and we keep her well hydrated we monitor her fluid and electrolyte balance so that is what is required as part of the management you see conservative management yes of course with a goal of maintaining the hemodynamic status maintaining the blood volume do not let hypovolemia set in keep the hematocrit under normal range and prevent the complications from developing okay so as far as the management of mild ohhs is concerned mild meaning that uh, the initial lab parameters are all normal she can accept orally she is having some mild abdominal pain and discomfort okay uh, there is no ascites there is no other organ involvement or derangement she is hemodynamically stable also in that case home based care can be given and she can be observed and she can be asked to keep herself well hydrated right in that you should ask her to avoid any physical exertion or strenuous activity she need not be bed ridden okay uh, there is no need for absolute complete bed rest because that is going to increase the risk of thrombosis so she needs to avoid exertion or strenuous activity and avoid intercourse because this puts her at increased risk of ovarian torsion so we should be careful that we tell her this and uh, she needs to monitor her fluid intake she needs to keep herself well hydrated at least a liter of fluid intake per day oral analgesics can be given for pain relief oral antiemetics can be given for nausea and vomiting uh, warn her about the danger signs if her vomiting is not settling down if her urine output is decreasing if her pain is increasing she needs to come back immediately and you need to weigh the patient daily also measurement of the weight is body weight is is important because any rapid gain in weight would mean that there is peripheral edema or anasarca setting in so all of these are important management aspects now if you're going to talk about the management of moderate to severe ohhs you have admitted the patient and after admitting the patient yes you need to have a careful monitoring of input and output urine output and whatever fluid you're giving her fluid and electrolyte balance uh, symptomatic treatment you're going to provide her watch for development of complications and at each step of time you need to assess uh, maybe she may at any point in time worsen and may need icu uh, care as well if complications develop so uh, if you talk about the uh, fluid balance iv fluids need to be given and normal saline is preferable because of the risk of uh, uh, hyponatremia that can be there if there are specific electrolyte imbalances they need to be corrected along with that symptomatic treatment in the form of analgesics and antiemetics uh, per enteral uh, an analgesics and antiemetics will need to be given when you uh, say about watching for complications yes of course you have to you know watch for development of hydrothorax so intermittent chest auscultation uh, monitoring her oxygen saturation monitoring the uh, hematocrit 
okay if there is worsening hematocrit particularly more than 55 percent is a very important danger sign of severity monitor her serum creatinine rising serum creatinine values are going to be very dangerous uh, keep monitoring the ovarian size if the ovaries are enlarging in size that means the disease is progressing so you watch for complications as well so you may need to repeat the blood investigations over time you may also need to repeat the ultrasound investigations ultrasound and radiological investigations over time and usually this much treatment is going to suffice but sometimes what happens is that the IV fluids are uh, with uh, with giving IV fluids the situation is like this that you know you want to correct the hypovolemia on the one hand and if you overcorrect, you may overhydrate, and then you can you know worsen the uh, peripheral edema or worsen the ascites or worsen the pruller effusion also so you have to maintain a tight balance so fluid Fluid balance may become challenging sometimes and uh, if IV fluids are not able to maintain the hemodynamic status or maintain the uh, blood volume in the normal range then you may have to give uh, albumin for volume expansion as well so this can be a second line therapy thromboprophylaxis in the form of low molecular weight heparin uh, in the form of uh, you know elastic compression stockings or the pneumatic compression devices they are all recommended to be used in moderate to uh, severe OHHS so in severe cases you will need to consider albumin you will need to consider thromboprophylaxis as well and diuretics now diuretics uh, should never be used initially because diuretics themselves they cause volume depletion right so they themselves you know because of uh, the uh, effect of these diuretics you know uh, what will happen is that already the patient is hemoconcentrated okay and then if you give diuretics on top of that you're going to make her even more hemoconcentrated right so diuretics are not a good choice to begin with they can be used if there is severe ascites if there is a pleural effusion and you want to treat that but after correcting the hematocrit and after correcting the hypovolemia so diuretics i'll say i'll mark in asterisks here are used only after correcting the hypovolemia and they should be used with caution an ultrasound guided paracentesis may also be required for severe cases you want to tap the ascitic fluid you want to tap uh, the pleural effusion that is fine and that needs to be done in case of severe painful ascites or you know respiratory compromise happening or oliguria that is not responding to fluid treatment then you may need to go for ultrasound guided parasynthesis so what do we see here we see here that this is a complication that arises in the gynecology department as a part of the IVF procedure okay and the present patient may present in the emergency with medical symptomatology involving multiple organs and the management is also along the medical lines and therefore it is very very important for a gynecologist to be aware of the medicine of it all and for the physician who may be taking care of such a patient to be aware of the gynecology of it all so a comprehensive multidisciplinary approach is needed for managing such complications okay